Hey guys, today I just wanted to quickly talk to you about the IBM PS2 Model 3286. Actually, that's not true at all. I really don't want to talk to you today about the IBM PS2 Model 3286. It just so happens I was filming another segment and this machine died, so I ended up doing a repair and I thought, hey, it's a good time to actually cover it. Now, I have a special place in my heart for these machines. This, these Model 3286s were the first computers with VGA color displays that I ever personally used. So, yeah, I'm quite fond of them. However, one topic that comes up a lot is they are quite sought after for sort of gaming PCs because, you know, IBM, big power switch, and they have the ISA bus, which means you can use things like Sound Blaster cards inside them. Now that's all good and well, but one thing I want to make sure that you're aware of is that, I mean, this is still a 286. It does run at 10 megahertz, but you're still talking about 1980s CPU, and if you're going to be playing games that are making really good use of that sound blaster, there's a good chance that they may be expecting slightly better hardware. Uh, one example of this was Jill of the Jungle, which I actually thought would run fine on this machine, just being a platformer, and it does run, and you can play it, but it just felt a little jaggy and a little slow, and... Yeah, I mean, if you want Sound Blaster and all that sort of stuff, I really recommend a 386 or a 486. Um, this was IBM's low-end model at the time, and even the years following where it was still selling in businesses, it was still a low-end machine. Now, it came with a high price, mainly because, you know, IBM, you get the support. It probably came as part of a solution, um, but it was still being affordable for small businesses, and you quite often see these in New Zealand with a lot of companies, you know. They, they want to get an IBM piece of the pie, the reliability, the support, all that sort of stuff, but didn't really want to spend huge amounts of money on their higher end machines. Uh, one of my other PS2s runs a solution called Ready to Run, which was a product from IBM, which included the machine, the software training, all of that. So you just bought the machine, took it home, you could do your taxes and your customer filing and all that, which is really cool. I might cover that in a separate video. One thing that interests me with PS2s is all of mine are white. None of them have gone yellow. So if you know, did IBM use a different plastic? Or have I just gotten lucky? Do you have a yellow PS2? Let me know in the comments, because I'm genuinely curious, but all of my PS2 systems are still bright white, and I just haven't seen a yellow one. It's quite interesting. So actually talking about the machine... The not going yellow is about the only positive thing I have to say. The hard drive in it is sluggish and proprietary. The floppy drive is standard, but once again proprietary. The power supply is once again non-standard, although it uses standard voltages and it's a decent size. It, it's just proprietary, and it doesn't have any Molex connectors, which makes adding hard drives and that sort of stuff very difficult. It's also got one of these Dallas real-time clock modules. So for it to keep the settings, like your time and date and the hard drive settings, you're going to need to hack this, or maybe you'll get lucky and a new old stock one on eBay, maybe the battery still works in it, you might get lucky, but my solution is always actually to hack into these and put your own battery module in them, so that way you don't have to deal with it later. The onboard video is VGA, it's nothing too exciting, it works, but, you know, that's it, it's not. But as far as I know, anyway, it doesn't have any XGA acceleration or anything like that. The memory, once again, proprietary. They are 30-pin SIMs. And I did read something on the internet that talked about how you can actually possibly modify standard SIMs to work in these systems. But really, by default, you're probably just going to end up using whatever RAM came with the system that you got. So, I mean, if you do get an opportunity to find a PS2 Model 3286 that's got one me more than one meg of RAM in it, and it's not wasting an expansion slot to do so, I would certainly grab that, because I think that's kind of interesting. However, the RAM isn't really a big issue. When you're still talking about a 286-era machine, one megabyte is generally perfectly fine, because you'd only really want more if you were running something like Windows 3.1, or an extremely big load of spreadsheet. I mean, to be honest though, I think it's really Windows 3.1 would be your main reason for wanting more extended memory. And that's just going to run slow on this machine. So really the one meg that you find in most of these systems is perfectly fine. Now at the start of this video I mentioned that I had to repair this guy. So you may be curious what went wrong with it. Well, it was put away in storage as a perfectly working system. I had done repair work on it, but it was perfectly working. I pulled it out of storage and the first thing I got was a 2401 error, which from memory is the VGA subsystem. I was also getting very bad output on the VGA port, and so I decided to switch to the motherboard. Now, that seems like a bit of an overkill, but 
at the same time with all SMD components these motherboards have underneath that you don't even see until you remove the motherboard and with the type of problem it was and not being able to visually see any faults it would have taken me a long time to diagnose and I'm not exactly 100% up on my skill level with SMD work yet so I figured I'd leave that for another day and I, in a recent collection I acquired a spare model 3286 motherboard so I thought it was a perfect opportunity to test it and potentially get the machine back running again. Now first we've got to rip out the original motherboard, just disconnecting everything, pulling out the real time clock and sliding the motherboard out. Here's the new one going in, you notice it's a different revision of the same motherboard, uh, I didn't know they made different revisions of this but apparently they did. This one doesn't have the tantalum capacitor which is a nice bonus. Now I'm just removing the original Dallas real time clock and fitting the one that's already attached to my battery case. The real nice thing with this is it's going to take my settings with it so I won't actually have to use the starter disk to boot the system up. Okay so with everything all hooked up it's time to hit the power and see if we boot and sure enough it booted absolutely fine. The next problem I had however is I went to install software and started having general failures. It didn't take me too long to see what the problem was here the main hard drive having megabytes of bad sectors. It was absolutely ludicrous and the drive was just unusable. Now with most drives of this style and capacity, a low level format is often what's called for, so I used IBM's utility to do this on the drive. The unfortunate thing with this was, is I get the feeling the drive actually was just faking the low level format because this did absolutely nothing for the reliability. This drive, even after a fresh DOS install and format, just continually kept misbehaving. I don't know how when sitting in storage it develops so many bad sectors. I'll look at the drive at a later date. For the meantime, we're going to go with an aftermarket solution. Now this is a Seagate ST125, just a normal MFM drive, and we're going to pair this up with this Procom RLL controller that I found. Now you can see there it's got a Molex connector, which is going to do our power, and using RLL means that this drive will now be 30 megabytes which will actually be an upgrade for this machine. So we just have to move over this bottom bracket. Now the S2125 or a modified version of it was actually sold new in these machines. I've seen quite a few of these machines with that drive in it. So the nice thing about that is it has the bolt holes that perfectly line up with that bottom bracket for the PS2 which is really nice. I did have to use different screws but it was nice that all that just bolted together. Now the next thing that I noticed here was my MFM cables there hanging off the back of the drive are actually going to be a little bit short. So now what I decided to do was flip them around so that the hard drive would be a little bit closer to the controller. Now the next thing of course once the machine was powered up was it was time to do a low level format. However unfortunately I didn't get the noise I was hoping for. Have a listen. Now this controller reported that this entire drive was all bad sectors so I decided to go through my box and see what other drives I could find. Now this Colic Octagon drive here was a perfect match, it had the right screw holes, the LED was in the right place, it was rated for RLL usage, and it had been tested by the previous owner. So let's see what that sounds like. Hmm. Two drives with the exact same issue, I find that rather unlikely. I think the problem here is likely the controller, so I decided to swap it out for a Western Digital, which thankfully had the same power port, and that worked absolutely fine. And just going to go through the low level format procedure and see how that goes. Alright, winner winner, chicken dinner. Now one thing is I prefer the drive to be in the right hand bay if possible because it gets slightly better ventilation from the power supply and it's going to cause a little bit less heat soak around the electronic components and this drive was running particularly hot. Now thankfully I found another set of hard drive cables which were slightly longer so I decided to flip them around and you can get a good look at this little clip in mechanism which actually isn't half bad. So during the low level format I was worried that I got the interleave setting completely wrong. Now interleave is quite important, basically the idea is, is that when the computer is ready for the next sector on a track you want it to be at the point where it's just about to hit the drive head. If it's already gone past then the drive has to go around a whole other revolution just to read that sector and on a drive with 26 sectors per track 
this could make file transfers very time consuming. So what I'm using here is Norton's Calibrate Utility, it's part of Norton Utilities version 6, and it will actually do the testing for us and give us some nice bar graph results. Alright, so trying out an interleave setting of 1, this is basically the sectors are one after each other, we see that the drive now needs to do 26 revolutions just to read one track. With a 2 to 1 interleave this gets slightly worse with 27 revolutions to read a track, 3 even worse, 28, 4 just as bad at 28, and 5, only 5 rotations. So that's our key setting here. We need to be using an interleave of 5 to get the absolute most performance from our hard drive. Norton Utilities will then make this change for me without deleting any of my data. It was a bit optimistic on the time. I can tell you that this actually took 4 hours. Alright, so we're all back together now, and I took the time to install a few games and a bit of software in my little networking solution. And I should also mention here that the reason that I used an 8-bit controller was just to make sure that it absolutely wasn't going to conflict with the internal controller that was in the IBM. The 8-bit cards tend to use completely different resources, and they have their own BIOS, which makes them a fairly safe option. And I can honestly say that whatever technology IBM used for their hard drive controller, it is absolutely no slower than the original drive. In fact, that to be honest, it actually feels faster to me than that Western Digital one that was in there before. And now I'm just going to do my little Jill of the Jungle test. This is kind of strange. I mean, I honestly thought that this game would play a bit better on this hardware. I'll let you guys be the judge. I also wanted to mention here, actually, you notice that 3.5 inch hard drive is very loud. I've found this to be quite common. Uh, three and a half inch MFM drives, I'm not sure if they use a thinner material, but these drives seem to have a much louder noise than many of my five and a quarter inch drives. Just in case you're wondering, this drive is actually a lot louder when I first pulled it out of that box. It's quietened down quite a bit and it doesn't get nowhere near as hot now, which was fantastic. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that quick look at the Model 3286. I'll see you next time. Well, you're going to PS2 it. With the IBM PS2.